Hello, everyone. I am Luba Vangelova, the founder of The Hub. And today I am having a conversation with Jennifer Trethaway, who is a parent volunteer for an organization called Lives in the Balance, founded by Dr. Russ Green, Ross Green, apologies. Um, and she is uh, based in Massachusetts and uh, she can uh, tell us a little bit more about how she became a volunteer for this uh, communications methodology called Collaborative and Proactive Solutions. We'll be talking about that today. Um, so over to you, Jennifer, if just in a nutshell, you can tell us about um, how you as um, someone who currently works in um, HR uh, came to, to this methodology for parenting purposes, but that can be applied more globally as, as we'll get to later. But um, tell us just a little about your journey. Good morning, Luba. Thank you for having me. Sure. Um, I came to Collaborative and Proactive Solutions, CPS for short, because it's an awfully big mouthful if you keep saying it. <laughs> um, as a parent, um, my son was in fifth grade and was struggling a lot, both at school and at home. Uh, and my, the school psychologist uh, gave me a copy of Lost at School, which is one of Dr. Green's books. Uh, and it was actually the second book of his I'd read. I read the first one, which is The Explosive Child, several years before that. Uh, and so I was a little bit familiar with the model from then. Um, but when I read it the first time, I wasn't ready to hear it. And then when I got lost at school, I thought, okay, well, it can't get any worse. Let's try this. <laughs> and unfortunately, I think that's how a lot of people have come to CPS. It's in a moment of desperation because it is a little bit different from most of what you hear and the information that you get from schools and from medical professionals. Uh, it's, it's kind of a departure from that. Um, the three main te basic tenets of CPS are people do well if they can, doing well is always preferable to not doing well, nobody wants you to be mad at them, and if someone isn't doing well in a situation, then it's because the situation is outstripping the skills that they have in that moment. So, <sighs> that was a lot to kind of of grasp as a parent you know my kid does well if he can not if he wants to and you want me to do what you want me to not punish him there have to be consequences and so it was it was a big idea to swallow uh, the first time around but then in a moment of absolute panic and despair uh, I thought, well, let's try it. And once we tried it and I saw how effective it was, I wished that I'd started when he was five. <laughs> and um, so just to set the stage, um, this is a technique that you've mentioned any parents can apply to their children, whether they experience that their children are, um, you know, having any kind of, you know, what they would consider, you know, significant challenges with dealing with something or not, like it can be used for a whole gamut of things and also with adults, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, there's another book that Dr. Green has written called um, Raising Human Beings, mm. which talks about it, using the model on a much broader basis. Um, one of the first things that I heard him say was that kids fall into two, well, people really fall into two categories. You don't have kids with behavior problems and it's not bad kids and good kids. You have kids who are unlucky and kids who are lucky. And the kids who are lucky express their frustration and their dysregulation 
in ways that are acceptable to the rest of the world and kids who are unlucky express it in ways that the rest of the world finds unacceptable. Things like biting, kicking, hitting, throwing things, spitting, yelling, um, all of those things. They're all just expressions. They're the same kind of expressions as the kid who's lucky enough to be able to ask for help or to just cry. <laughs> or to just put their head down on their desk and express it in a way that doesn't disturb the whole room. Mm. Uh, it's all the same. So it can be used in any situation where there's an expectation that isn't being met, whether it's with a behaviorally challenging child or not, or an adult with behavioral challenges or not. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, so you uh, mentioned the three main tenets um, of uh, CPS. Could you just um, drill down a little bit and um, someone else who uh, practices this explained it to me as a win-win um, type of uh, approach. Is that how you would also look at it looking for win-win solutions and how that would be different from compromise? Absolutely. Uh, I, I have described it. One of the ways that I volunteer for the organization, I am one of the parent moderators in the Facebook group for people who are using this with their challenging kids. We have two Facebook groups for parents. Um, one of them is for kids who have behavioral challenges and one is for parents of kids who are just trying to parent their lucky kids. Um, and the one that I'm in is the unlucky kid group. Um, it's called the B team. And one of the things that I've described in there is sort of the difference between collaboration and compromise. And in compromise, you have two people who come to the table and each one already has a solution in mind. I know what I want out of this conversation. And they discuss it and they each decide what they're willing to give up and what they absolutely insist that they must have. And they leave the situation having compromised, but without anybody's needs having been entirely met in collaboration, which is what the model strives to create, everybody comes to the table with their concerns about the situation. They put their solutions aside for the moment and they just talk about what their concerns are, what their needs are. Sorry, my dog is scratching on the counter. Um, what their ne His needs are not being met right now. <laughs> uh, what their needs are and they discuss what the needs are of the group. And oftentimes they find that a lot, of, some of their needs might be the same, but then they work together to find a solution that meets all of those needs. So everybody walks away having their needs been met. Okay. Um, and so what about situations where needs are in conflict with each other and it's not possible to meet everyone's needs. Can you just talk us through and perhaps using an example of, you know, a particularly tricky situation that might be um, kind of uh, useful to, to then um, serve as an example um, of how it can be applied? Well, the way that the model works, there are three steps in the what what they call what we call plan b which is the basic conversation that is sort of the the basis of cps um and the first step is the what dr green calls the empathy step and that's the step where you start the conversation with the other person hey i noticed that when we were getting ready to leave last night, you were having a really hard time. Can we talk about what was going on? And you use the empathy step to draw out, drill down into 
your kid's concern or the other person's concern. It doesn't have to be with a kid. Um, and find out what was making it hard for them, why they were struggling to do whatever it was that you wanted them to do. Then in the second step, which is the parent concern step or the adult concern step, um, or the other part, the, the me concerns, um, you talk about why it was challenging for you to not be able to do whatever it was. And then the third step is the invitation step, which is the, I wonder if there's a way that we could meet your concerns and my concerns. Um, so I'm trying, to, an example in my family, uh, a couple summers ago, we have a camp that we spend a lot of weekends in New Hampshire. Uh, and my husband likes to go mountain biking with, uh, my other cousins who are up there. And this one particular weekend, they were planning an epic mountain biking ride on Saturday. And it's about an hour and 15 minutes away from where we live. And this particular night, my son didn't want to go. He had some things he wanted to be able to do on his computer that weekend. Uh, there was a group of people that he was planning some kind of a video game raid thing with um, beyond my understanding, but it was very important to him and he didn't want to go. And so we came to this, this dead end where my husband said we're going and that's final and my son got very upset and you know i'm not going you can't make me and so we took a step back and it's well you know let's really figure out what's going on here and it seemed in the beginning you're talking about having um, needs be at odds there's almost always a way Sometimes it just, it takes a lot of thought. And in the end, that weekend, it wasn't about being away for the whole weekend. It was about figuring out a way that my husband could go bike riding and my son could be on his computer. Uh, so I got up really early and my husband and I drove up to New Hampshire and he went bike riding and we spent the day up there and then we drove home later that afternoon um left my son who is old enough that he could be home alone for the day um you know he's not he's not seven <laughs> he's in his late teens now um so he stayed home did his thing we made sure that there was food for him to eat there were people around if he needed them um and he stayed here for the day by himself. And my husband went up bike riding, my son did his thing online and everyone came home happy. A lot of times it's a question of being willing to give your child's concerns the same amount of weight as your own concerns. Uh, I said to my husband that day, if you said to me, we're going and that's final, and I said to you, there's something going on that I really need to be here for, would you tell me that I had to go? Would you tell me that I had no choice in the matter? He said, well, of course not. I said, well, then why is it any different for him? Why are his concerns less important than your concerns? And that's tough as a parent because we feel like we waited to get to this point to be able to be in charge and we want to be in charge. And a lot of times being in charge is way less important than developing a positive and healthy relationship. And that can be a really hard thing to grasp. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um... Uh, I'm just trying to think, um, there was one example of um, some friends of mine that were planning to go on a car trip to visit relatives, mm -hmm. um, extended family for whatever length of time, and their child who was younger than your son. Yep. 
um, he just didn't want to go, didn't want to go. They talked to him for hours, tried to talk him into it. He just didn't want to go and they canceled the trip. Uh, you know, they couldn't leave him by himself. And I guess um, I'm trying to think in that kind of situation. I mean, I suppose they could have possibly tried to find friends that he could stay with, but I, I don't know that they would have felt comfortable with that or, you know, felt like, I, I don't know if an um, opportunity like that was even an option. But so I'm trying to think, you know, in some situations, um, you know, how perhaps, you know, what would be the next thing to try? <laughs> well, you, if, if I can backtrack a little yeah. bit, um, the, the whole idea of CPS is starts with a situation in which there's an unmet expectation. Um, so in that situation, the expectation is that the kid will get in the car and go to visit the relatives. Um, and when you hit a point that there's an unmet expectation, you have three options in collaborative and proactive solutions. And the first option is what we call plan A, which is traditional parenting. That's the, I said, you're going and that's final. Uh, it's a unilateral adult imposed decision solution. Um, sometimes it's, if you get in the car, I will, you know, we'll buy you that video game that you wanted or, you know, we'll stop for ice cream on the way, <laughs> but those are all solutions that a parent comes up with on their own, no input from the kid. Then there's plan C, which is, okay, we're gonna let go of this expectation for right now. Um, and that can be appropriate if you just feel like it's not worth it to you to try and, and keep going. And then, or if you really recognize that it's beyond your kid's skills, um, plan C can be a useful option. Uh, and then there's plan B, which I was talking about before with the three steps. Before, you use any of the plans, I find it really helpful to stop and really think about my expectation. You know, is it is it really a valid expectation of the kid? Do they understand entirely what I'm asking of them? Have I made it clear beyond a shadow of a doubt? My son is a very rigid thinker. If it's not all of A, it must be B. You know, there's, there's no in between. Uh, so there are a lot of things that I realized that I thought were implicit and he doesn't do implicit. Mm. <laughs> uh, so I had to really grasp whether or not he understood what I was asking of him. In that situation, when you're talking about they spent hours trying to convince him if you're trying to convince someone of something, that's plan A. That's an adult imposed solution. Um, and a lot of times in the early days of using CPS, I did what I call plan A and plan B close, where I go through and try to get his concerns and, and really be as empathetic as I could and listen as much as I could and then use the rest of the conversation to try and bring him around to my way of thinking. Um, but that doesn't take whatever his concerns are into place. In that situation, I would say, did they know why he didn't want to go? I don't <laughs> remember. And I'm not sure yeah. I, I knew that and, detail. And that's the crux of it, that if, uh, behavior is sort of the fever. It's, it's the symptom of whatever the problem that underlies it is. And it doesn't matter what kind of behavior it is. It's, you know, anything that's 
that someone does that makes them not meet your expectation is a symptom of whatever is underneath that. CPS is a way of getting beyond the behavior underneath the, the display of no, I'm not doing that to figure out what's causing the problem, what's causing the other person to not meet that expectation. Mm -hmm. And if you don't know why someone can't do something or why someone is insisting on not doing something, remember people do well if they can, not if they want to. So if you don't know why, then no solution that you can offer up is going to be a fully viable one because you don't know if you're addressing the problem or not. Mm. Okay. And that, oh. that remains true no matter who the person is that's on the other side of the conversation. And um, does this, is there an age range at which this starts to work effectively? I mean, before children can uh, verbalize certain perhaps very nuanced feelings um, or to really understand why they're feeling something. Um, is there a certain age at which this um, becomes viable and less so at an earlier age? Uh, our, our admin in the B team group uh, who is the director of outreach for Lives in the Balance. She's, she's actually a paid employee. Um, the rest of us are all volunteers. Um, but she started using CPS with her son when he was not yet three. I mean, he was, um, but, you know, you know your kid. And one of the best tools in, in my toolbox has always been um, what Dr. Green calls the five finger method. And you can sim simplize, simple, excuse me, make it simpler <laughs> just to, to yes or no, uh, where, you know, you don't seem like you're, you're really feeling like you wanna do this. Um, can I make some guesses as to what's going on? And you can tell me, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, or, you know, in our case, by the time we started, my son was old enough that I could say on a scale of one to five, one, no, that's not it at all. Two, that's it a little bit. Three, yeah, that's somewhat it. Four, really, that's almost it. Five, that's it exactly. Um, and just make some guesses. <clears throat> and mm -hmm. most of the time, parents know their kids well enough that they have some idea of what might be going on. Mm -hmm. um, and once you start to hone in on what it is that's happening in their head, then even a kid who doesn't have that nuanced language can recognize that you're saying enough of how they feel that mm -hmm. they could give you a thumbs up. Mm -hmm. okay. um, it also doesn't require eye contact. <laughs> Um, one of my, my best CPS conversations in our early days, my son was in his bed with his blankets all pulled up over his head and his stuffed animals on top of that and just his hands sticking out so that I could see his fingers. <laughs> so. Um, uh, and so what about, are there children who... Um, are just very private and resistant to maybe explain or to acknowledge a, a certain, you know, feeling or um, like maybe it's difficult for them. They don't want to acknowledge it or something. Uh, are there situations like that or, or if they're just um, private? Absolutely. Um, and again, like I said, it doesn't have to be face-to-face -face eye contact. We've had parents who've had entire Plan B conversations by text mm. or um, by, you know, writing a note. Um, I know one person who has a Plan B notebook and mm -hmm. they'll write something and then their kid will write something back and then they'll mm -hmm. write something. Uh, and the other thing is that there's not a timeline on it. You know, there's some plan B conversations go like that, and some can take <laughs> epic amounts of time. Mm 
Um, and it's, it's not a quick fix, but the payoff is hugely worth it. In our case, things had been tough in our family for quite some time. So it took really kind of explaining, this is what we're going to do. You know, I feel like we're fighting a lot and that's not the way I want our house to feel. So how about if we try something different? So it took explaining it to get some kid buy-in and some kids really wanna understand what's going on. Some kids will hear it and think, well, this sounds like therapy, I'm not talking. Mm -hmm. um, Kim often talks about how if a kid won't let you in a door, then you've got to find a window. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and it does take trust between two people to be able to successfully utilize the model. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes you have to build that slowly. Mm. And a lot of times it requires reminding the other person a lot, you know, I'm not mad, I'm just trying to understand, help me understand. We're not gonna, you know, you're not in trouble. We're not, I'm just trying to understand. I'm not gonna make you do anything. Just trying to figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. And most of the time then, slowly you can start to. So, so those are phrases that kind of help neutralize the tension that may exist in the guardedness um, so that the rest of the steps can then be taken, it yeah. sounds like. Um, and do all of the adult members of a household need to be on board in using this? Or have you seen <laughs> it effectively be used if only one adult is using it and the other one is still doing the kind of more conventional plan A? <laughs> um, <laughs> in my house. I was on board long before my husband was, um, several months before. And, you know, it, it, one of the other things that I heard Dr. Green say early on uh, that stuck in my head is the easiest way to convince someone that plan B works is to just keep doing plan B. And in our house, it became very apparent that he was still using traditional parenting models and I was using CPS and only one of us was being successful. <laughs> only one of us was getting to a place where things were getting easier and we were getting closer and our relationship was building trust. And my husband finally said to me, okay, teach me about your way because my way obviously isn't working. Um, so even if only one person in the house, it definitely is easier if everybody's on board, mm -hmm. but everybody doesn't have to be on board for it to still work. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, so this... Um, you said it's not a quick fix. Um, <laughs> clearly, um, you know, I mean, it's much faster to say, do this or else, and then, you know, uh, kind of, um, but is it a case of um, short term, let's call it pain, if, if it feels painful to use a lot of time to have a discussion that it feels like you're not sure where it's going to go, where you're going to end up. Um, so perhaps short-term pain for long-term gain, like at the end, is it really actually, um, I mean, I, I tend to kind of think more in terms of instead of time expenditure, energy expenditure is actually, I think, much more you know, our energy is much more valuable. So even if something is a quick fix, but your energy from having a bad strained relationship 
then, you know, is draining energy from you in other ways for, you know, hours or days afterward, mm -hmm. then, you know, what's the cumulative energy expenditure from doing, you know, one thing versus another. Um, so do you, do you see it that way as kind of like, yes, it's a bigger upfront investment or a, of a different kind, at least? But, Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the amazing thing about about using CPS is that it's not like teaching somebody how to fish or teaching somebody how to read or teaching somebody how to use the stove where you know once they're once you've taught them that they can do it and it's obvious that they've gained a skill and you move on to the next skill. Uh, CPS teaches skills much more indirectly. However, um, even when you're working on just one thing over here, what the really cool thing is that what a kid learns in doing this thing over here suddenly also applies to the thing here and the thing here and the thing here. Mm -hmm. And so even if they're, even if the things over here are not the things that you're directly working on, suddenly everything becomes easier. Can you and, give some examples? Um, because it's a communication model, uh, it's not it's not a behavioral program. So the more that you concentrate on this one thing, um, I can remember we had done several successful Plan Bs. And we were kind of plan seeing a lot of things in our house. We had let go of a lot of expectations just because everybody at that point was very overwhelmed. And we hadn't gone out of the house for quite some time <laughs> as a family, just because it, it wasn't worth it. We were setting ourselves up to fail. And that's always been a big rule for me. Don't set yourselves up to fail if you know that it's going to be hard before you even set foot out the door stop and think about what's in your plan that you can let go of um, so it was my mother-in-law's birthday and we very much wanted to go out to dinner with her and this was something that we hadn't been working on at all we'd been working on things like not slamming doors and um, you know getting off the computer when it was time to get off the computer and not eating sugar all day from start to finish. Um, but my son came in and he said we were going to go to a hibachi place and he refers to them as cook on your table restaurants and on his own and he was maybe 12 at this point, maybe 13. We hadn't been doing CPS for very long, maybe about a year. And he, he came to me on his own and he said, mommy, I really don't like the cook on your table places. They smell funny from the oil and you have to sit with other people and they try to talk to you. And I really hate that. So, do you think Mame might want to go to Bertucci's for her birthday instead? <laughs> so, you know, he came on his own to me and up front before we even started to have to have a negative interaction, put all of his concerns on the table, recognized that our concern was that we wanted to go out for her birthday and then offered up a solution all on his own without anybody saying a word. And I was just floored. It was like, oh, wow, this really is working. <laughs> That's great. So um, so from the initial tenants that you said, um, you know, that people do well if, uh, as well as they can mm -hmm. and, and about building skills. So, so this would be an example of skill building and then putting those skills into play yeah. um, to kind of uh, think through the other person's perspective and their own needs and so on. Um, and so how long do you think is realistic to start seeing results like that? Well, 
it, you know, for us, like I said, it was, it was about a year from when we started, but at the beginning of that year, we were a family in huge crisis. Mm-hmm. We were, we were in what I describe as the pit <laughs> where you feel like a terrible parent and your kid is going to grow up to be that person on the news that all the neighbors say, <laughs> bad parenting. Uh, and you think that, you know, everybody thinks you're a terrible parent and it's never going to get any better. And, uh, the pit lies to you a lot. It tells you that you're stuck there and you're alone and there's nothing you can do. And that isn't at all true, but we were deep in the pit and we were three people who were very much at odds. Um, And it took about two months before my husband came on board and then probably within another month after that i realized that instead of being three people who were constantly just trying to figure out how to win power over each other because that's really where we were i'm going to be the one in charge um it was probably it, it literally was about three months until we hit a point where I looked around and realized that we were three people who were all on the same team who were working toward a common goal. Hmm. And to go from where we started, which took several years to spiral downward into that point where we were just all in a state of unhappy, stressful dysregulation all the time to get to that place, it was certainly worth the investment. And if you're starting off, where you're not in that terrible a place, you should Mm -hmm. see that result come about much more quickly. Mm -hmm. Okay. And um, so can you give an example? Well, you mentioned a couple of examples that I think are probably going to be very familiar to a lot of parents (laughs) about uh, getting off the computer or eating sugar all day. Can you, um, since those are, I think, very, very common concerns, can you just um, spell out kind of some tips of how parents could approach, let's say, those two things specifically? Um, Because I imagine the needs um, on the parts of the parents and of the children probably have a lot of commonality between, you know, family and family and family, you know. So could you perhaps um, spell those out? <laughs> sure. oh, now apparently I'm no longer meeting the needs of the dog holding on to okay. it. Okay, Bo, go ahead. Get down. Hey. <laughs> he didn't want to go, but he wanted to go. Um, well, It was, you know, again, every plan B solution is going to be a little bit different because there are some things that were not important to us that other parents might feel like are are very important to them. Um, But, and it took a lot of conversation um, and it took my sitting down with my son and letting him actually show me what he was doing on the computer. I learned how to play Minecraft. I'm terrible at it. I'm really terrible at it. And he and all of his friends would laugh at me and, and we'd, they'd bring me into survival where I would immediately get killed by something immediately. Um, and then they would laugh and I would regenerate and immediately get killed by something else. (laughs) (laughs) But, um, we one of that was one of the things that we came up with was that you know if i wanted to spend time with him it wasn't fair for it to always be what i wanted to do some of it was you know well what if you spend some time with me doing what i want to do um we had you know there were certain things that we felt were really important that he come off of the computer for uh and those things it was you know all right so i'm giving you a 15 minute warning i'm giving you a 10 minute warning and at the 10 minute warning it would be let's have a conversation about 
you know, what are you doing? Is this something that in 10 minutes you can really wrap up? Um, is there a reason why you would need more than 10 minutes? Uh, and sometimes I had to be willing to let go and let him stay on a little bit longer uh, because he might have been working with a group of other people and leaving in that moment was going to negatively affect the people that he was playing with. And that was a huge concern for him. And it might not feel like a huge concern to a parent, but to him, that was enormous. And these are his friends and he didn't want to let them down. And that's a common, you know, everybody feels that way. For him, it was about that. For me, it might be about not letting down my coworkers. But for him, in that moment, these are his coworkers and he didn't want to let them down. Um, and then, you know, just so for us, it was that, that sort of step reminder and the willingness on my part to recognize when what I was asking him to do really wasn't a valid expectation and to be willing to bend in the situation and to make sure that he understood ahead of time what his time restraints were. If we had to leave in half an hour, that's not a good time for him to start something that's going to take an hour and a half to do. Um, but that took some time investment on my part. Uh, and for some kids, that's a very easy thing. And for other kids who have trouble with transitions, that can be really hard. So for a parent to expect even both kids in their household to be able to handle it the same way is not necessarily a valid expectation. It's really a question of truly exploring what your kid's needs are in the situation and what your own needs are. So the same solution won't work for everyone. Mm -hmm. And how would the parents' needs be expressed in the case of you know, getting off the computer? I mean, if the child argues, well, you know, the, they want to spend, you know, whatever, however many hours on the computer, like how would the parent express their needs in a way that the child would be able to relate to and understand? Um, well, I mean, it depends on what those needs are. If, if the needs are, because I feel that you should be doing more things than just playing on the computer, Sometimes, sometimes that's a question of parenting the kid that you have instead of the kid that you wanted. <laughs> um, I'm a huge reader. I have been since I was a little kid. Um, I started early and never go anywhere without a book. My son would rather let somebody cut his arm off than have them tell him that he needs to spend time reading. Um, and I can remember my mom signed me up for sports club when I was little because she felt like it was important for me to be a little more well-rounded and not, not spend all of my time reading, that I should know how to do some physical activity things. And at the end of the second session, the woman who was running it walked me back out to the car handed my mother her check and told her that it was in everybody's best interest that she just let me read. Um, because I was picking up my book in between my turns and then getting annoyed because I was at a really good part and I just wanted to finish the chapter when it was my turn. My team was getting frustrated with me. And so that was the end of my, my sports <laughs> involvement for pretty much the rest of my life. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a question of really examining your expectations. And is this an expectation that's a valid expectation of your child? Or is this something that you're expecting because you think it's the right thing to do 
because other people are looking at you and saying, that's what your child should be doing. Um, and those are questions that you really have to answer yourself before you start that conversation. Uh, if you're really concerned because your kid is sitting in the dark and gaining weight from sitting in front of the computer all day, then you know there are other ways that you can can get physical activity that don't involve having to go outside. Um, for a long time, my son had a mini trampoline and his desk was raised up so that instead of sitting in his chair, he was on the trampoline and he would bounce while he played in between typing things on his, his screen, which got him moving. Uh, so it was a solution that met both of our concerns that didn't involve the solution that I had in my head before we went into the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, he had a sun lamp in there for a while because he would, it was too cold for him to be on to be outside. He's a skinny, skinny kid. So he gets cold really easily. So he wouldn't want to be outside. So we had a, a, one of those um, like sad lamps mm -hmm. that, so that he was getting some, some feedback into his system that he wasn't getting because he wasn't going outside um, without having to do something that he was uncomfortable with. It met my concern and his concern, but it wasn't a place that we ever would have started from in the beginning when I said, you need to go outside. And he said, no, I'm busy playing. Mm -hmm. And so in that example, he acknowledged your concern about physical activity and movement mm -hmm. and agreed with it. I, I suppose there has to then be agreement that it's a valid concern. <laughs> Not necessarily. No. Okay. No. Um, that's the thing is that I don't have to agree with your concerns. You don't have to agree with mine. You just have to acknowledge that it has to be part of the solution. You don't have to think it's a problem, but it has to be part of the solution because the solution has to meet both of our concerns. Okay. And, and okay. So, <laughs> so the goal is more kind of high level, like we are people who have to coexist and yeah. <laughs> our, our um, concerns, our main concerns have to be met. Um, okay. And, um, and then just, I don't know, real quick on the eating sugar thing, same principles, um, like just anything different about that example? You know, and that's, that's the beautiful thing is that the model is the same, no matter what the problem is, no matter what the concerns are, it's, it, it works the same way. And the end result, and if, if you come to a conclusion, like if, if you come to a solution that at the time feels like it's going to be a good solution, and then in practice, turns out to not be such a good solution. Um, it doesn't mean you did it wrong. It doesn't mean that you failed. It doesn't mean that you have to go back to plan A. It just means that you have to drill down a little more. There are some concerns that it didn't meet that you maybe thought it did, or you didn't quite get all of them on the table in the beginning. Um, you know, sometimes a solution requires more effort from either a parent or a kid than it makes sense to ask to be part of that solution. Uh, so it just means going back into that conversation. Okay, so we tried this. Why do you, you know, why do you think it's not working? Um, and see if you can at that point figure out something that addresses the concerns from before and any concerns that the failed solution might have brought up. And so in the example of eating sugar, I mean, kind of in a typical, I think, scenario, um, the parents might say, well, eat some broccoli. If you eat some broccoli, at least, then, you know, I'm fine with you eating whatever, <laughs> which would be, I guess, you know, in the category of a compromise. So what would a win-win, you know, outcome look like? 
Um, again, it, 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 <laughs> and I hate to sound like a broken record, but it depends on the concerns. Mm. If the kids' mm. concerns are that they only like things, the taste of things that have sugar in them. Mm -hmm. um, and the parents' concerns are, well, then you're not getting the, the nutrients that you need. Um, and I can remember my pediatrician saying to me when, when my son was really small, his stomach is about this big. <laughs> so for him, whatever it is that he's taking in, it might feel to you like it's not remotely enough for, for him to continue to exist. Because um, at one point I joked that he existed on candy and boogers and air because he was mm -hmm. a little boy. Um, and he said, you know, don't worry about it so much as long as, as long as he's growing the way that he's supposed to be growing, then don't be quite so concerned about it. Um, and that was, that was, that helped me to sort of form my expectations a little better. Uh, and so, you know, we, we had in our conversation, we came to a solution where he agreed to taste, you know, two things a week <laughs> and that, that, and maybe he'd like them and maybe he wouldn't. And if he didn't, then I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't ask him to do it again. And some of the things he liked and he was willing to add into his repertoire and some he didn't. And I moved on from those. Um, but it was a, anything can be a viable solution if both parties agree to it and feel like their concerns are addressed. Okay. All right. Um, and then, um, so we've covered a lot of ground, um, just, uh, in parting, um, what are kind of three main takeaways or action steps that parents can start putting into practice um, from this methodology? Um, um, the one of my favorite things about Lives in the Balance and about Dr. Green is that you can learn the model without spending a dime. Um, everything that you need to learn the process is available for free on their website. It's not behind a paywall. It's, it's all there if you want to take the time to read it. And uh, it's livesinthebalance.org is the website. And there's a section on there called the walking tour for parents. And it's a series of very short videos and we're in the process, um, thanks to some parents who very generously donated their time and or some money in getting um, transcripts made of all of the videos as well that are getting posted. Um, <laughs> I say we, I mean they. I feel like I'm part of the organization. I, I am not a, a paid member of it, but... Uh, so the best thing to do if you're interested in learning the model, watch the first three videos, which is probably about, a, it's less than a half an hour of your time. Um, but if you go to the website, go to the walking tour. And then I would say just start to pay attention to how you interact with your kid. Um, a lot of us as parents, when our kids ask for something, we have sort of the reflexive no. <laughs> uh, you know, I want ice cream for breakfast. Oh no. <laughs> um, and one of my other fellow parent volunteers uh, talks about how she taught herself to ask three questions, to stop for a minute, recognize that you're not even really listening to what your kid is asking for. You're just reflexively saying no without giving it a whole lot of thought. Stop, take a breath and think, okay, why am I saying no to this? And if you ask three questions of your kid, huh, well, what made you decide ice cream for breakfast was a good idea? Um, 
because truly the basis of CPS and the reason that it's a successful model is because everybody wants to be heard. Everybody wants to feel like you're listening to them. And if you're giving your kid a reflexive no, then they're not feeling heard. Um, and it's amazing what you can learn from your child if you ask. So if you start to pay attention to how you're interacting with them, and what you're asking them and what you're just assuming you know, uh, it can be very, very eye-opening. All right, and, um, and just real quick, you, I, uh, you mentioned uh, before we started um, the recording that uh, you had also used this in your professional life and with adults, <laughs> so um, basically same principles, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I worked in the medical field for years um, in HR and in administration. And I had one employee who had been having a really hard time in her job for, you know, and in, in a lot of cases would probably have been written up and then fired. Um, and she and I spent a lot of time talking and we figured out some things that from our conversation that would help her to be able to meet those expectations. And at the end of one of our conversations, she said to me, you know, I, I, I never mind when you call me and say, we have to talk because even at the end of the conversation, if I don't feel like you're gonna be able to do what I've asked you for, I still feel like you heard me and you listened to what I had to say. And that's the most important thing that CPS does. It makes everybody feel heard and it gives everybody a seat at the table in the conversation. Mm -hmm. And really that, that fulfills a need that people have that is often unmet. All right, well, thank you very much. And um, if people want more information, like you said, it's livesinthebalance.org. And the two Facebook groups are Elevate Your Parenting and the B Team. And we welcome people and, and they're there to help people learn the model, to practice on each other, uh, to get through the nuances and, mm -hmm. and become better at using it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>